Hello everyone, my name is Jonas Brunschwig. I am the CEO of Swiss Next in India and I want to welcome you to Next Trends Asia in person with Sushmita Mohanty. Sushmita Mohanty is a long-term friend of Swiss Next from her San Francisco day. She is a serial entrepreneur, the only person to have started space companies on three different continents, and she has now launched her latest venture here in India as India's first uh, space-dedicated think tank, Spaceport Sarabhai. Sushmita, welcome. Thank you, Jonas. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, like you said, I think um, I was uh, I started my professional space career in the United States. Uh, I worked for NASA Johnson for a brief bit uh, on shuttle Mir missions. The space shuttle had been retired uh, for almost 10 years now, and the Mir space station doesn't fly anymore either. But I started with those missions. Um, then I went on to work for Boeing in Huntington Beach in Southern California um, for the International Space Station program. Um, in 2000, I decided that it was time to go out and start my own little outfit. So I moved to San Francisco, started a small company there called Moonfront. And a few years down the line, I started a second company in Europe, in Vienna. Um, the Vienna company was focused mainly on designing and building exploration systems. Uh, I moved, when I say exploration systems, I mean habitats and rovers and spacesuits, that kind of stuff. I moved back to India in 2008 and I started uh, my third company, which is called Earth to Orbit. I should also add that I grew up in the early 70s in Ahmedabad where Vikram Sarabhai, the founder of the space program, had just uh, hired sort of his dream team of young engineers who had studied in India and abroad and come back. And they were starting to build India's first earth stations, uh, satellites, and eventually rockets. Um, the other exposure that I had growing up, um, which had a very big influence on me and what I did, was architecture, contemporary architecture, because Ahmedabad is home to cotton mill older families who would commission the most amazing contemporary architects of the time. Um, Charles Correa, B.V. Doshi, uh, Corbusier, Louis Kahn. So if you put space and architecture together, what you have is space architecture. And I have, as a result of this kind of a mix of the art, arts, uh, whether it's architecture, design, technology, I've always wanted to and therefore chosen to live a renaissance life. And that's what attracted me to Swiss Next when I was in San Francisco, because um, I thought here was an organization working happily at the intersection of the arts and the sciences. So that's sort of my um, journey so far. And the, during the pandemic, I sort of had a chance to recalibrate and think where I am with things and what is it that I want to do in the coming decade. And I think the reason um, I chose to launch a space, a space think tank in India at this time is because India has now, for the past 50 years, does, um, done amazing things in terms of space applications, technology development, but they haven't done enough in creating the right environment for young entrepreneurs, for innovative technologies to flourish outside of the space agency. Um, also, I think having lived in California, in Europe, um, and having worked with the Americans, the Russians, the Japanese, the Europeans, I always find that India is missing in a lot of the international space fora. So India needs an international voice. So those are the two main reasons why I thought it's time to start a space think tank. Wonderful. So you have a very eclectic background, very international background. And here you are now having founded Spaceport Sarabhai, uh, India's first uh, space think tank, to, to bring India's voice uh, out to the world. Uh, and you started hinting at it a little bit, uh, that, that you want to foster uh, an, an open entrepreneurial environment um, for different perspectives to, to come into play. And, and I think one of the striking points of Spaceport Sarabhai, and I'm quoting here, is not just science, technology, policy, law, but also history, anthropology, economics, the environment, sociology, psychology, contemporary culture, art, architecture, design, archaeology, and more. Yeah, I think I think that's 
we definitely want space for Sarabhai. I'm saying we because we have a small founding team, uh, also a very multidisciplinary team. We have lawyers and policy experts and technologists uh, and someone from a pol political science background as well. So I think the reason we want, let me give you a couple of initiatives which we've already, um, which have, we have already gotten the going. One is we are thinking of creating a very unusual uh, yet public focused uh, archive of the Indian space program through oral history documentation. Um, you know, I mean, we, I think it's very important to look at the historical evolution of the Indian space program and people ought to know about it. There's yet another project which we have initiated at IAM Kozi Kode in Kerala, where we have a couple of doctoral students doing management research for us. They are um, under the guidance of Professor Gopala Krishnan, who also teaches in Liverpool and IAM Kozi Kode. What we want to do is we want to develop research-based metrics to drive policy making in India. Currently, if you look at the policy drafts that have been put out by the government, they have been largely written by ISRO scientists with a little bit of help from the lawyers. So this, these two studies that we have initiated, for example, one of them will look at why do Indian space entrepreneurs um, prefer incorporating their companies abroad, even if they want to do business in India. The second question that we are going to look into is in terms of procurement styles, what kind of procurement styles exist in other parts of the world, in the United States, in Europe? What are the best practices? And what can we do to change the way things are procured, the way the supply chain works in India to create maximum impact, you know, through uh, in terms of business and in terms of applications? So those are the two questions. So I think economics and, you know, for example, even if you look at the Indian space sector or the industry that we have, even if it's fledgling, um, Nobody has really worked on the sizing of the uh, space industry in India. That's, a, that's another question we want to be looking at. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we're just getting started. And I think it's going to be a very colorful, very multidisciplinary approach. So for, for our next Trans Asia audience, which is largely outside of Asia and is very interested in, in hearing and understanding what the emerging trends uh, coming out of Asia are, what would you say uh, that is special about India and maybe not just India, you can contextualize it within the Eastern uh, uh, part of the world? Yeah, I think that's, that's a question I love. So, um, I mean, having been in the world of space pretty much all my life, I feel that the last century space narrative was largely driven by NASA and Hollywood films. So, world over, people have very little idea of what's happening in Asia. Um, so if you look at who landed on the moon in the recent past, China landed on the moon three times, successive consecutive landings, uh, which I think is an amazing accomplishment. The last time the Americans landed was in 1972, and the last time the Russians landed was in 1976. Not only did China <laughs> land successfully thrice in recent years, it also brought back lunar samples after 44 years. If you look at Japan, for example, what I love about Japan is they do very unusual missions. They did a mission where they went to, um, it's, it's called Hayabusa. They recently did the second Hayabusa mission, which is a sequel to the first one. They go to an asteroid and collect asteroid dust and bring it back to Earth. These kind of sample return missions are very difficult because one, you have to touch down at a planetary destination or an asteroid destination and gather the regolith, the dust, whatever you, whatever you have there and successfully bring it back to Earth for analysis. The other mission that Japan did, which again, I think is pretty eclectic, is uh, they worked with a fisherman of repute and designed a special net which they wanted to deploy in low Earth orbit to sort of collect space debris. Uh, okay, the mission went a bit awry because the net didn't deploy as planned. But I think, um, and, and Japan, like China, I mean, it has its own rockets, it builds its own satellites. Uh, similarly, India too, has one of the oldest space programs, people don't know about it. We did our first experimental launch in 63, way back. 
Um, and India too has the capability. It's a launch capable nation. There are only seven launch capable nations in the world. So I think even just between these three spacefaring nations, which I can with confidence say are in the top five or six in the world, uh, there are some amazing missions that are happening. And I think it's important for the world to wrap their head around this part of the world and see what's going on. And, and in the in the Swiss space sector, of course, we're, we're no stranger to India's capabilities because four Swiss satellites have been launched. Uh, there you by, go. By, uh, <laughs> On the PSLV. Absolutely. And and so looking now beyond the established space programs and, and sort of this, this emerging ecosystem of uh, change makers that you want to enable and that you want to give a platform to and to include their voice, uh, at a global level, what are what are some of the most exciting things that you've seen come out of India, not from the space program, but from everywhere else? Uh, what I mean by new space is companies that were created in this century, in this millennium, rather than the mega corporations of the last century, like uh, Boeing or Lockheed or Airbus, which in in that sense are old space. The, the wonderful thing about new space is that these are smaller companies, way more agile, uh, doing cutting edge stuff at like fraction of the budget. Um, and India too is now has a very, very active new space community. Um, we have almost, I would say 50 odd companies doing wonderful things from building small satellites to green propulsion systems. Um, to downstream applications for, let's say, the seafood industry or agriculture or the insurance companies. So I think, um, and, and Switzerland too. In fact, Europe also has a very uh, exciting new space uh, scene, so to speak. Um, I think that said, I think having lived in California for 12 years, having lived in San Francisco for nine, I think Europe and India have things to learn from the California ecosystem. Uh, while we have amazing talent, amazing uh, brain power, amazing appetite for risk, young people wanting to build things and launch things, we don't have the same level of funding opportunities that you have in, the, in, in California, for example. Uh, we don't have the same level of, um, you know, the, the venture capital community being willing to invest in space companies because the gestation periods are longer. So I think we need a change in mindset, both in the private investor community in India and Europe for that matter, to be a little more generous. Um, and even the regulatory environment needs to ease a little. That, that becomes a big hurdle for young entrepreneurs as well. Let's close the conversation talking a little bit about your engagements with Switzerland, which uh, have picked up uh, in, in recent years. Do you want to tell us a little bit more yes, about... Yes, all thanks to Swissnex, um, in fact. So your predecessor, Seb, um, he had invited me to Swissnex Day in Lausanne a couple of years ago, uh, which was a perfect opportunity for me to meet people in Switzerland doing amazing things. And the one that really um, resonated with me was work around space environmentalism. So for example, I got to meet Natalia Archinard in Bern. She's a diplomat who has been the chair of UN COPUS, the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And Switzerland, being a neutral country in many ways, is a perfect candidate to push for uh, enforceable laws with foresight to not only declutter lower space, which has plenty of man-made debris. Um, like I said, Switzerland has the moral high ground, so to speak, because the countries which are littering low Earth orbit are the United States, Russia, China, um, and private companies like SpaceX, which are going to be launching a constellation of, what, 42,000 satellites. So I, I am now um, in touch with these guys. There's also something called the International Center for risk governance within EPFL, which also looks at policy side of things, legal side of things, to contain this debris menace and other such sustainability issues. So they are also ones I'm now starting to work with. Um, the other entity that's been on my radar and I've been in touch with those guys is um, a, a small company called ClearSpace. They are building technology which can be deployed in low Earth orbit to clean up, to mitigate uh, the problem of debris. 
so yeah, I think it's um, it's it's just beginning, and I I think it's going to be a long happy ride. Well, wonderful. We look forward to growing the engagements uh, with you with India in the space sector. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jonas, for having me.